well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I know this is the end of a really long day, uh, last day of the conference. We're all a little tired. Uh, and uh, we do have to save our energy for Aaron's keynote. Uh, so it's all, always a lot of fun, so don't miss it. Uh, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, we do have some uh, good things, uh, important things to talk about. So, uh, uh, so to start off, uh, who is this person up here? Uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I've been a Ruby developer for about 12-ish years or so. Uh, other languages for longer than that. Uh, spent most of that time uh, in early stage startups, uh, really small companies. Uh, currently, though, I work at a, a different kind of company. Um, yeah, my, my current company is such a small company, uh, so it's a bit careful about its messaging. Uh, so some quick notes. Uh, I'm not speaking uh, as their representative. Uh, this is my talk, and my views are my own, not my employer's. Uh, that said, uh, my employer does own my code. Uh, and for whatever reason, that actually includes examples on slides. So I should mention that uh, the code samples uh, in this talk are copyright Google and licensed under Apache 2.0. So that's stuff out of the way. Um, uh, I have to say that uh, I was really impressed by David's, uh, David's opening keynote. Um, uh, I liked what he was saying uh, about the importance of belief systems. Uh, those underlying values that uh, should anchor us and, and anchor our, uh, uh, our decision making. Uh, the importance of recognizing what those values are and how they define us. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I really appreciated his message. And one thing that it made me think about uh, was what are the values that have rubbed off on me uh, through uh, all the various small companies and not so small companies that I've worked for. One of the common themes, I think, uh, across all these organizations, uh, big or small, but especially the good ones, uh, has been, been the importance of measurement, uh, of data. I remember my, uh, my first Rails startup. Uh, it was back in the beginning of 2007 or so that we launched our, our first Rails site. And um, uh, so 2007, we were on Rails 1.0, so uh, good old days. And, I remember a few months uh, after we launched, uh, our CEO was uh, on national TV, uh, live on national TV, for something totally unrelated to our company. Um, uh, so he was, he was on, this, uh, on this interview, and he happens to uh, uh, accidentally drop the name of our site uh, on, uh, on national TV. So it was totally unplanned. He didn't intend to do it. Uh, but it wasn't on national TV, and uh, the show was actually pretty popular at the time. So as you might guess, within a few minutes, uh, I get a page uh, from our monitoring system. And yes, our, our site started to get really sluggish. Um, took a look at our logs, and we were seeing a multiple orders of magnitude traffic spike. Um, so this was, uh, this is of course, you know, it's both a good thing and not so good, right? Uh, but it was in 2007, and uh, we didn't have these, these nice auto-scaling uh, cloud services that we do now. Uh, we were on physical servers in Ocolo at the time, and so uh, I spent the next couple of hours uh, logged into those servers. I was trying everything I could think of uh, to increase our capacity. So I, I was tweaking our load balancers. Uh, I was you know, disabling features. Uh, I was spinning up more mongrels per machine. Uh, we, we were running under mongrel 1.0 at the time. That was the uh, uh, state of the art uh, at the time. Nothing really worked. Uh, we, were just, we, we were just extremely laggy. And uh, uh, I, I guess eventually, after a few hours, traffic kind of settled down a bit and, uh, and the site recovered. But in the meantime, we were flailing around uh, in the dark. Uh, now, later, when we did our post-mortem investigation, um, we, we determined, uh, among other things, that our mongrels were actually memory constrained. Uh, so we had, uh, we, we had these uh, in-memory caches uh, within each mongrel process. Uh, and as traffic went up, uh, these caches would get squeezed and would start thrashing. Uh, so you know, we just, it, it, you know, it, it just started falling over. Uh, so my attempt to fix the problem by spinning up more mongrels uh, was just squeezing memory even more and uh, making the problem even worse. Um, the worst part of this was I couldn't even tell that this was happening. Uh, uh, we had a caching strategy. Uh, we thought it would work, but 
uh, I didn't really have good data on its actual behavior in production. Um, and as a result, we weren't really able to respond well uh, when we, we ran into a production issue. And so it's crucial to have real data uh, on what your app is actually doing in production when it's under production load. And this is true whether you're just starting out, as we were, or whether you're uh, one of the largest, uh, most successful companies and have the largest products, some of the largest products in the industry. You have to know what's going on. So at, at the small company that I, that I work for now, we, we measure everything. And if you're, uh, if you're just starting off, if you're just launching your first app, you also need to measure uh, everything. So how do you do that? Well, to begin with the obvious, uh, there are a number of excellent services out there, obviously, uh, that do system monitoring, application monitoring. Uh, this screenshot here shows Stackdriver, which, uh, full disclosure, is uh, actually developed by my current small employer. Uh, but there are a number of other companies and a number of other products that are very, very good. Uh, and if you spent some time down the hall at the exhibit, so you've probably met some of them. Uh, performance monitoring services, uh, error monitoring, uh, who here uses some kind of monitoring service in production? Okay, that, that's good. That seems like a majority. Um, yeah, those services generally do a really good job of collecting data and uh, providing visualization and analysis tools. Uh, that said, uh, there will be times when you do need to customize, uh, when you need to measure something that a general purpose tool uh, won't give you out of the box. So this afternoon, what we're going to do is we're going to take a peek under the hood uh, at some of the techniques that uh, these monitoring uh, services use uh, to instrument your application. And you'll see how you can use some of these techniques to perform your own monitoring. Uh, or you can customize the existing monitoring uh, for uh, the services that you're using to fit your application's needs. So here's what we'll cover. Uh, we'll learn techniques for instrumenting your app. Uh, we'll look at uh, how to gather data without disrupting uh, your running app's behavior in production. Uh, then finally, we'll uh, discuss what sort of things you should be measuring. So let's talk about instrumentation. This is an instrument. Uh, it's an old electro retinograph machine. It's used to diagnose a variety of, uh, of retinal problems. Uh, modern versions of this instrument are a lot smaller, maybe a little bit less scary, uh, but old or modern, uh, these machines do actually have one thing in common. Uh, they have electrodes, and those electrodes need to be in direct contact with your eyes uh, in order to measure things. So generally a patient is given anesthetic eye drops. Uh, so a little bit scary, um, but necessary. And similarly, uh, when you're collecting data from a running application, uh, measurements do need to be in direct contact uh, with the code that's, being in, that, that's involved. And that's the job of an instrumentation API. It, it, it's uh, to, to collect uh, data from running application, uh, it, just, it gives you the ability to inject uh, measuring code at key points uh, in your application, to put that measurement code uh, in direct contact with the code that's being run. Rails apps. Uh, can use an instrumentation API called Active Support Notifications. To see how this API works, let's take a look at an example. So remember my imploding cache? How would you know if your cache is working the way that you expect? In my case, uh, caches were running out of space. And when that happens, you probably see a lot of cache misses. Right? Indeed, your cache hit rate is a good indicator of the health of your cache in general. So let's measure it. And we'll do this by using notifications uh, to count the cache hits and the cache misses. So here's what that would look like. Uh, whenever Rails reads from a cache, uh, it calls uh, this method, active support notifications instrument. This call takes a measurement of uh, the caching code. It notes that the cache was, uh, was read, uh, records how long that took, uh, and it records other information, such as uh, the cache key that was read and whether it was resulted in a cache hit or a cache miss. Uh, it gives all that measurement data a name. Uh, in this case, cache read dot active support. So Rails is actually already doing all of this for us. Uh, we say it instruments uh, its cache code. So in your app, 
uh, what you can do is you can subscribe to this measurement. And you do this by calling uh, Active Support Notifications Subscribe. Uh, so you give it the name of the measurement uh, that you're interested in, and you give it a block. And whenever that measurement is taken, notifications will call your subscriber block and give you a chance to do something with that measurement data. Now, I won't go into all the details of the API. That's something that you can look up on your own. Uh, in this example, um, uh, all we're doing is uh, we're, we're taking whether the, uh, the cache hit. Uh, is this right? Yeah. Uh, in this example, uh, all we're doing is the, taking whether the cache hit or missed, uh, and we're logging it. So now we have a log that might look something like this. After, well, afterwards, we can run simple tools like grep or word count on our log and analyze that data and get useful statistics. Now, Rails uh, actually already instruments a number of things for you uh, in addition to cache read. Uh, so for many measurements, uh, all you have to do is subscribe to them. But you can also call instrument yourself uh, and instrument your own code. And this is actually particularly important uh, when you're writing your own Rails plugins. Uh, it's a good idea to instrument your plugin uh, so that applications that use your code can measure its activity and its performance. All right, so, so far, we're receiving notifications of all our cache hits and cache misses. Uh, we're logging them, so we have an overall measurement of the cache hit rate. This is already interesting data, and as you can see, it's very easy to get, just a couple of lines of code. But to make it more useful, uh, we sometimes need to collect a bit of context. So let's take a look at another old medical instrument. Uh, this is a vintage x-ray machine, actually, from, a, from about 1900 or so. Uh, at that time, x-ray machines were a little more than a, a tube of radioactive material that uh, the doctor would just kind of position over the patient. Um, so obviously, many of the early experimenters with uh, x-ray imagery weren't really aware of some of the hazards uh, of radiation exposure. Uh, there, so there were some illnesses and some deaths in uh, both patients as well as uh, doctors and researchers uh, around this time. Nowadays, of course, uh, when we x-ray, we're very careful uh, and we're very specific about targeting exactly uh, the, the part of the body that we need to measure. And this is something that you also want to do uh, when you're instrumenting your app. Uh, most apps have a number of controllers uh, and actions. Uh, I actually was just talking to someone a few days ago whose uh, company had a, a monorail with around 400 controllers. Uh, most of us don't have apps that large, but uh, uh, still, you often want to focus down your measurements a, a little more than, uh, than measuring that entire application. Uh, so one particular controller or maybe even one particular action. So what if I wanted to measure cache hit rate uh, for just one particular action that was interesting? So the first option that might come to mind is, okay, let, let's turn notifications on at the start of the action and turn them off at the end. Uh, trouble is, notifications uh, are global. Uh, they apply to all threads at once, and so uh, that would include uh, threads that might be running uh, other requests. Um, a lot of us are probably on multi-threaded uh, web service at this point, and so uh, this won't work in those cases. So what do we do? So here's a technique that you can use. Uh, let's start with our existing cache subscriber. So right now, it's logging on every cache read, uh, regardless of which action is being executed. Now we can determine the action uh, by subscribing to a different measurement. Uh, in this case, the, the start processing event. Uh, this is a measurement that's taken uh, at the start uh, of processing a request uh, by action controller. It captures various information such as which controller and which action is gonna be executed. Uh, so we can determine here uh, whether to take a cache measurement. Now we need to communicate that information to our cache read block, right? And we need to do that uh, on a per thread basis. So we can't use a global variable. Uh, so for that purpose, uh, Active Support provides a per-thread module attribute. Uh, so you, you might have seen uh, module attributes uh, like mAtter, uh, reader, mAtter, accessor. Uh, normal module attributes are basically just global variables, and they're attached to a module. But there's also this, uh, this version that can have a different value per thread 
It's actually just the convenience wrapper around the thread local variable, if you're familiar with that from Ruby. Um, but using this pattern, we can now communicate between our subscriber blocks on a per request basis. Um, obviously, there are still some caveats. Uh, these are still globals, uh, even if they're thread scoped, so use them with care. Um, uh, for example, number of web servers, I think Puma is one of them, um, will actually reuse threads across multiple requests. Uh, so make sure that this kind of data actually gets cleaned up uh, or reset between requests. It's not a perfect solution, but uh, it's good enough, I think, for this purpose. So now we have a technique for measuring cache hit data and for doing so for a particular action. Okay. Let's take it a step further. Here's another interesting looking instrument. Uh, this one's from about 1960. Uh, it's hard to see here in this photo, but the subject is wearing contact lenses, uh, and they have miniature lamps uh, connected to them. Uh, so it's actually able to, uh, to capture eye movements and eye reflexes. Uh, at the same time, uh, the whole contraption moves, uh, and the motion causes visual illusions. Uh, so the device is actually gathering uh, multiple different sources of data, uh, combining eye measurements uh, and machine motion, and it's using that to study some of the, the mechanics of uh, visual perception. Uh, combining information from multiple sources, correlating that information, something that you need to do quite often uh, when you're instrumenting your application. Uh, for example, it's helpful to know your cache hit rate, but it would also be good to know how much a cache hit actually buys us. Uh, is the request latency uh, actually any different uh, if, you, if your cache hits or misses? So again, here's the code that we were just looking at. Uh, we're determining which action is running uh, and then measuring whether there's a cache hit or a cache miss, and then we log that information. We can th get the request latency uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, in this case, uh, we can subscribe to yet another event, uh, the process action event. Uh, this measurement is taken at the end of an action by Action Controller. Uh, so it can provide information uh, about what happened with the action, such as the HTTP result or the latency. Uh, so in this case, in this example, we've uh, added a controller, I'm sorry, we've added the subscriber to uh, the process uh, action event, uh, and we're logging uh, the request latency. So we have two log lines now, uh, logging the cache hit or miss, logging the latency. To make this more useful, we should combine these two pieces of data, cache hit or cache miss and latency, and log them together. And once again, we do that by using a per thread attributes to communicate between the subscribers. So now those two pieces of data are logged together. And when we run this in production, uh, we might get log data that looks something like this. Uh, so as you can see, there's kind of a clear latency win when we get a cache hit. Uh, but it looks like our cache hit rate uh, might be a little bit lower than we would hope. So now we have actual useful information that we can apply towards improving our cache behavior or as my PM friends at my small company like to say, we have actionable data. So we've gone through an example using notifications. Uh, there are several other instrumentation APIs that might be useful. Come on. There we go. One of the simplest ways uh, to instrument an app is to use controller filters. Uh, here's a simple around filter that just measures the latency of the action. Uh, so this is the easiest way to gather really simple information uh, about a uh, request as a whole. Uh, you can also write a rack middleware. Uh, this is useful if you want to measure the behavior or latency of other middleware, because uh, you can insert your middleware any place uh, in the middleware stack. Uh, you can also use this to install instrumentation code uh, in uh, other frameworks, uh, Sinatra, Padrino, Hanami, uh, any non-Rails frameworks that might not use active support. Uh, finally, there's TracePoint. Now, I think of TracePoint as kind of the sledgehammer of uh, all instrumentation APIs. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit different that it's not part of a framework, not part of a web framework. Uh, it's actually part of the Ruby virtual machine. Uh, it works similarly. Uh, it, it's, uh, you, you provide code uh, that gets run when certain events happen, uh, in this case at the language level, so events like an exception was thrown or uh, a method was called or a return from a method or even move to the next line in the source code. Uh, 
So it's, uh, it's a very powerful uh, API. It's a bit specialized, um, probably more commonly used for debuggers uh, than for monitoring. Uh, at my small company, we actually use it pretty extensively to uh, build a cloud-based debugger product because it lets us instrument down at, at the source code level. Uh, but it's probably not something you use that often uh, for monitoring. Uh, it is extremely powerful, however, however and that uh, brings up an important issue. So here's another image. Uh, this device is from 1940. Uh, it actually measures brain waves. Uh, I think uh, in this case it was uh, uh, measuring uh, brain waves for someone who had gone through some PTSD uh, due to wartime, uh, wartime experiences. Um, but you know, we look at uh, images like this, and some of them you know, are a little bit scary, right? We, we wonder if uh, these machines are safe. We wonder if it's, is it going to observe my brain, or is it going to reprogram my brain, right? Um, so this is an important question uh, when instrumenting in production. Uh, it's critical that we can take measurements uh, in production against real traffic, but it's also critical that we don't change the behavior uh, of our app in the process. We don't reprogram our app just because we're taking measurements. Safety is, an, is incredibly important uh, when instrumenting. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Uh, one major component uh, of safety is that of keeping the latency effect uh, to a minimum. Uh, so here are some tips for, uh, for going about that. Uh, first of all, as we, said, as we saw, uh, isolate and spotlight the interesting use cases. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you don't need data from the entire app, but maybe just a few uh, particular controllers of interest or a few particular actions. So isolate those. Uh, I encourage you to experiment uh, with instru instrumenting new things, uh, gathering new pieces of data. Uh, however, uh, always go circle back and reevaluate. If it turns out that some measurement is not really giving you in interesting information after all, uh, don't be afraid to delete it. Uh, I tend to treat instrumentation myself like tests. Uh, many of them should live on indefinitely because uh, they're, they're monitoring critical systems. Uh, but there are some that really are only useful temporarily, uh, maybe because they're part of a one-time investigation that you did. Uh, or maybe because uh, you put them in and it turns out they, they're, they're not actually as useful as you thought they would be. Uh, if you leave them around too long, they'll just slow you down, just like your tests uh, might, uh, might just take longer than you really want. Uh, so practice making those judgment calls. Uh, don't be afraid to spin up new instrumentation, but don't be afraid to delete them as well. Sample your data if you can. Uh, often you can get away with measuring only one in a hundred instances or one in a thousand. Trace points uh, can be particularly dangerous uh, because many of its events can fire extremely often. Remember, uh, move to the next line in the source code. Uh, so use it only when you have no other choice. Uh, if you do need to use trace points, uh, here's a pro tip. Uh, it's global by default, uh, just like we saw with uh, active support notifications. It applies to all threads uh, at once. However, there is an alternative uh, trace point API that you can use uh, that lets you instrument just a single thread at a time. The catch is it's only available, uh, as far as I, uh, last time I checked, uh, as a C API. Uh, you can't call it directly from Ruby, so it's harder to use. Uh, but it is available and it's worth investigating if you want to use trace points uh, temporarily for specific requests. Finally, of course, pay attention to how you're reporting your measurements. Now, if you're just logging to the file system, uh, that's usually pretty fast. Uh, but as your app grows, uh, you might want to send, start sending data to a remote analytics service. Uh, you might want to start sending data uh, to your application monitoring service that you're using. Uh, and so when you do that, make sure you don't block on those calls. Uh, usually the, the uh, API uh, gems for the, for the monitoring services will have a non-blocking uh, version of, those, uh, of, of the clients that you can use. Uh, if you have to use uh, just straight HTTP calls, be careful of it net HTTP post uh, because it is blocking it. It waits for the, for the, uh, the response to come back. Uh, you don't want to do that. Uh, so use an asynchronous client. Uh, if you can, spin up a background thread. Uh, send your data in batches, uh, if that's allowed by your API. 
in general, just be very careful about how you're reporting your measurements. Uh, another element of safety uh, is avoiding side effects. Uh, those are changes to your app's behavior. So on one hand, it's kind of obvious, you know, don't modify your application state uh, in, in your subscribers. Uh, but side effects can take many forms. Uh, a database query, in addition to potentially adding latency, uh, sh you should also consider the side effect. It might not nominally change the state of your application, uh, but it does change its behavior uh, because you're invoking parts of your system that you otherwise wouldn't. Uh, so be careful about those sorts of things. In, in particular, uh, calling methods on active record models, some of them might initiate additional database calls. So you want to be careful about that. So we've talked a lot about how to measure. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, let's spend, our, spend those uh, on what to measure. There we go. This is uh, an early ECG machine, uh, electrocardiograph machine. I think some people saw, uh, say EKG. Uh, this is from 1901. Uh, it was actually the first uh, machine that was sensitive enough uh, and practical for medical use. Uh, I think scientists had, uh, had experimented with some of this uh, similar technology as early as the late 1700s, uh, but it wasn't until around 1901 uh, that uh, it became practical. Uh, again, it's uh, measuring electrical activity. Uh, the electrodes here are actually in the, these metal basins uh, next to the patient, so you would have uh, one foot and both hands uh, immersed in salt solution uh, in these basins. Uh, ECGs are, of course, still widely used today, uh, not just to diagnose heart conditions, uh, but also to monitor patients who are critically ill uh, or undergoing general anesthesia. Uh, this is, of course, because the heart uh, is an indicator, right? Uh, something is going wrong. It often shows up in the heart's behavior. So what are the indicators for your application? What are those things that can tell us uh, when things are not healthy? or when something unexpected is happening, or something has gone critically wrong. So here are some of those uh, things that you can measure. First, results. The responses that you're sending back from your requests. Make sure they're in line with what you expect. Uh, one indicator that's sometimes really important is how big are your responses? Are those sizes uh, what you expect? Uh, also, pay special attention to error responses. And obviously, if you 500, then there, there's, there's problems going on. Uh, but don't ignore your 400 levels, uh, 400 error levels as well. Uh, when I was younger and less experienced, uh, I tended to make the mistake of ignoring my 404 error rates, because uh, I was thinking, oh, it's, it's just client error, it's not server error, so it's not my problem. Uh, you might not necessarily want to get paged uh, if you see a 404 spike, uh, but you do want to know that it's going on, because uh, it could mean that there's a broken link someplace, or it could mean someone's trying to hack your site. Uh, it's an indicator that something is going on. You should at least know about it. Uh, your final responses are important indicators, but not the only ones. Sometimes you have intermediate results uh, that can be useful. Uh, another thing is pay attention to rendering. Uh, Rails templates are really not the fastest thing in the world. Uh, I've just come to realize that over years of using them. Uh, rendering can have a significant impact uh, on your app's latency, uh, so measure it. Not too long ago, um, I was actually working on an API that uh, uh, occasionally, uh, just occasionally, ran really slowly. Uh, and as we dug into this, uh, it turned out that uh, it was actually the JSON serialization uh, that was taking up the bulk of the latency. Some weird, uh, some weird interaction between uh, what my data looked like and some uh, issues with my JSON library. Um, so, you know, if something like that is going on, would you be able to tell? Uh, of course, measure your interfaces with external systems. Uh, that means your database, uh, external APIs, uh, internal APIs, Microsoft, sorry, M word. Uh, Services, APIs, uh, your caches, <laughs> file system. Now, all of out of the box uh, monitoring products uh, will, will capture many of these things for you, obviously, but uh, not everything. Uh, they typically po focus on the performance uh, of these external dependencies, uh, like how long your database queries tend to take. 
uh, but what's often missing is your usage. Is your application using the external system in the way that you expect? Are you hitting your cache as often as you think you should be? Finally, errors and exceptions are important. Don't throw any errors away. Don't throw any errors away. That includes expected errors. It includes errors that uh, you handle internally in your system and you don't bubble up to your users. They can still be indicators. An important example that uh, often gets overlooked is retries. Often when you call an external API, uh, you implement retry logic, right? Because network can be flaky, you know, various things can be flaky. Uh, but if you retry, don't throw that information away. Instrument your retry code. Make sure that that information shows up on your monitoring dashboard. Uh, your retry rate is an indicator. If you get a retry spike, something's going on. You want to know about it. So we've covered a lot here. And really, we've just scratched the surface uh, on a number of things. But I hope I've communicated the importance uh, of measuring. Again, it's something that uh, at my small company right now, we just, we, we just do all the time out of habit. Uh, getting started is really simple. Uh, subscribe to an active support notification, as we saw. Just a few lines of code. Measure something and log it. Or many of the commercial products uh, that are out there have free trials. Go check one out. It's free. However you do it, start measuring. If nothing else, the data will be interesting to look at. It could also save you a big headache in the future. So that's all I have. Thank you.